Welcome, my name is Madeline Liddicote and I'm the Associate Director of Science and Society, which houses the MA in Bioethics and Science Policy. Um, I'm pleased that you've taken this opportunity to meet our founding director, Dr. Nita Farahani, um, as she introduces Lee Teitrick, who is a, the new Distinguished Fellow, uh, fa Faculty Fellow in eth Ethical Technology. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, you'll all be muted uh, during the first portion of the presentation, um, but you're welcome to, um, to send me um, questions via chat. We will leave about 15 minutes at the end of this session for a QA. and a um, And also this session will be recorded. There are several people that uh, um, are wanting to come to this but, uh, but couldn't make it this morning. So with that, um, I will go ahead and get started. Um, First, I want to introduce Nita Farahani. She is the um, Robinson O. Everett Distinguished Professor of Law and Philosophy at Duke Law School. As a leading scholar in ethical, legal, and social implications of emerging technology, Nita founded the, in, the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, and um, which, which also offers the um, MA in Bioethics and Science Policy. Nita is a frequent commentator um, for national media and presents her work to diverse audiences such as the World Economic Forum, the Aspen Ideas Festival, TED, and even presenting or even testifying in front of the US Congress. In 2010, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to the Presidential Commission on the Study of Bioethical Issues and served until 2017. She is a member of the National Advisory Council for the National Institutes of Neurolog Neurological Disease and Stroke, an elected member of the American Law Institute, president of the International Neuroethics Society, and a member of the Neuroethics Working Group of the US Brain Initiative, among other distinguished positions. She is also chair elect of the section, of the jurisprud section on jurisprudence for the Association of American Law Schools. She serves on the scientific and ethics advisory boards for several corporations. In collaboration with Stanford and Harvard, Nita is the co-editor of the and co-founder of the Journal of Law and the Bioethics, Biosciences. Sorry, um, she is an editorial board member of the American Journal of Bioethics and board of advisors on Scientific American. Uh, Nita received, received her AB in genetics, cell, and de developmental biology at Dartmouth College, a JD and MA from Duke University and as well as a PhD in philosophy. She also holds an ALM in biology from Harvard University. In 2004 through 2005, Farahani clerked for Judge Judith W. Rogers at the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, after which she joined the faculty of Vanderbilt University. In 2011, Nita was the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor of Human Rights at Stanford Law School. Now I'd like to introduce you also to Lee Teitrick. Um, Nita will introduce you to Lee, who who's, joins Duke with a joint appointment as a Duke law professor on the practice, uh, a law professor of the practice and distinguished faculty fellow in ethical technology for science and society. Her arrival complements our growing research in, in, and engagement and educational offerings in ethical technology. Lee has a 30 year career bridging technology, law and policy as a partner in the global law firm of Covington and Burling LLP, where she served as a co-chair for the firm's global and multidisciplinary artificial intelligence initiative. She has written and spoken extensively on AI, data and emerging technology to several leading institutes worldwide. She serves on the board of visitors here at Duke University, Pratt School of Engineering and the, Dean, the Dean's Council at Penn Law and um, and on the board of the US, UC Hastings College of Law and Work-Life Law Center. Lee is admitted to the practice be, to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. She's a champion for diversity and include, equity and inclusion and was appointed the founding chair of the Covington's Women's Forum in 2003 and later serves as the co-chair for the firm-wide diversity committee. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School and earned a BS degree in electrical engineering here at Duke. She's also a proud Duke parent. With that, I'll leave it to Nita to begin the discussion with Lee. Thanks, Madeline, and welcome everyone. So delighted to have you here to learn a little bit more about our MA program, but also to get a chance to learn about some of our fabulous faculty, including Lee Tydrick, um, and what we're planning on doing in the ethical tech space. 
Um, as you know, the MA in Bioethics and Science Policy uh, has both um, a focus on clinical bioethics, but also has a focus on uh, technology ethics. And because of that, we've been really growing what we've been doing in this space. We've been growing our programming, we've been growing um, our faculty, and we've been bringing in world experts like Lee who can help us navigate this new space. And so I wanted to have a conversation with Lee to understand a little bit more of her background for all of you, to help share that with all of you. Um, to have her talk a little bit about her two courses that she's teaching this semester, um, some of her engagements, but also how she got into this space. Because one of the questions that I often get asked by students, particularly students who are interested in coming into a program like the MA, um, is how do I do what you're doing? And I think uh, for somebody like Lee, how do you get to be engaged in all of the phenomenal things that she's engaged in? And she's gonna be engaged in even more now that she has a little bit more freedom to do so having left Covington because there are lots of ways in which being a partner at a law firm uh, gives you opportunities, but also restricts what you can do. And so Lee, thank you for joining me here today. We couldn't be more thrilled to have you as our first distinguished faculty fellow in ethical technology at Science and Society and also um, a professor at the law school, given your distinguished background and career, but also the opportunity to pivot and focus more on academia from what you've been doing. I was hoping we could start by talking a little bit about your career to date. Um, and maybe starting with, you know, the fact that you've been a partner for quite a number of years, recently having retired from the practice of law at Covington. Um, but how you got into the AI and ethical tech space. And so how does somebody who is in you know, kind of big law at one of the top law firms in the world really pivot their focus and their and, and their practice area in AI. So I was hoping you could kind of start us there with a little background. Yeah, well, um, thank you very much, Nita, for the introduction. And as somebody, um, you know, who's got a 30 plus year history with Duke, it is just such a thrill to be able to return to Duke in this in this role. And I must say, I mean, I think kind of the, the genesis of it really kind of started at, at Duke. I studied engineering at Duke and had a passion for the technology and then went on to law school. And, you know, I was fortunate throughout my legal career and I spent virtually my entire career with one law firm. Um, and, you know, it was based in Washington, D.C., but we practiced really at the intersection of technology law and policy, and we helped clients not only with what the technology was today, but also always help clients kind of look around the corner at what technology was coming down the pike and trying to help them prepare um, for the businesses of the future. So not to date myself too much, but when I first got out of law school um, in the 1990s, um, what you're all carrying in your pockets, your phones, that you know, people didn't have those back then. And what we're all using today to communicate, you know, the internet was not something that was popular back then. Um, it was something that was used primarily by academic researchers. So, you know, kind of the genesis of, of what I was doing really was, you know, back then in the 1990s was helping companies um, with ideas in their heads, some small companies, some larger companies of how do we take this ideas of cellular communications? How do we take this idea of the internet and how do we make these into commercial offerings and how do we do it responsibly? How do we do it ethically? How do we navigate the legal landscape when the technology is evolving faster than the law? So really when I got my start out of school, you know, having gone to Duke, which inspired my passion on the technology, and then I went on to law school, you know, I started working with clients on sort of that basic challenge of, you know, taking new technologies and trying to figure out ways to bring them um, to society in a way that's legal, in a way that's ethical, in a way that you have to kind of craft the legal landscapes. And, you know, the challenges have been there, you know, what's changed over the years has really been the technologies, you know, back then it was cellular and the internet, um, you know, fast forward to today, um, it's been things like um, artificial intelligence, internet of things, thinking about some of the cryptocurrencies. 
And, you know, a few years ago, you know, artificial intelligence is something that's been around for quite some time. Um, if any of you have seen the movie, The Imagination Games, you know, we all know it's been around, but certainly with the proliferation of data, of algorithms, of uh, the advances in compute technology, it's gotten a lot more attention. So the number of companies that were looking to capitalize on this um, commercially had, had really increased. The amount of attention it was getting from policymakers had increased. So my firm decided, well, we should start to put together a practice um, to help companies um, address some of the challenges of, um, of, of going forward with artificial intelligence businesses. So I was putting that together and it really is kind of a three-legged school of working on the policy issues, because again, the, the technologies evolve faster than the policy front, um, helping companies on what they ought to do organizationally, which gets into the whole ethics by design of, you know, how do you go forward when the ethics um, landscape hasn't fully matured, when the legal landscape hasn't fully matured, and then also helping them out on the transaction structure because deals look very different um, when you're dealing with new technologies. So that's kind of um, in the nutshell uh, how my, my career has evolved. And then I've done a lot of teaching um, through, through the years and finally decided that to follow my passion and teach full time. Well, we couldn't be more thrilled about that. Yes. Um, I think that's incredibly exciting and really exciting for our students. And part of what you've been doing um, over the past few months is, is thinking as you move to full-time teaching, what are the skills that are needed for a person who wants to really be able to understand and engage in this space? Um, and one of the things that you've been designing is a practicum for students, an ethical technology practicum. Um, and uh, that, that involves both thinking about problems that students could work on directly, but also in, in developing your syllabus and developing the course structure, what are the things that you need to learn to be able to do that? Particularly if you know, you're, for example, an MA student rather than a law student. A law student may come at a, a problem differently than an MA student would, um, and that the law student might be focused more on some of the issues, as you mentioned, like the transactional issues or the legal landscape, whereas the MA student may be focused much more on um, the ethical issues, the normative issues of how, how you come up with the oughts um, and what principles you draw from. And so as you've been thinking about that, I was, I was hoping you could talk us through a little bit both what the ethical technology practicum will do, what that class looks like, but also how you've been thinking about um, what the skills are that you need to learn, what the basic and fundamentals are that you feel like a student needs to be equipped with in order to be able to ultimately advise a client on an issue that they bring forward. Yeah, and I do think um, kind of picking up on what you said, Nita, it, it is a skill set that you need to learn because, um, you know, one thing that I've certainly learned throughout my 30 years of practice is the technology and the issues change very quickly quickly, but if you have the basic skills, you can always adapt and solve. And I think um, there is kind of growing consensus um, in the industry among all different types of stakeholders that to solve some of these really difficult issues, whether we're talking artificial intelligence, whether we're talking um, on the bioethics side, it really takes a village. Um, it takes a whole bunch of different skill sets um, coming together. Um, it takes ethicists, it takes legal experts, it takes technologists. Um, so part of what we want to do in the practicum is cultivate the skill sets of having people um, with different backgrounds getting used to working together um, to, to solve problems um, collectively. So one of the things that the practicum is going to do is bring people together from different schools. So having MA students this semester working with law students, and we're hoping um, in future semesters to be able to bring in um, some, possibly some of the engineering students, some of the comp sci students. And then also um, I've been working, we, we're gonna have real world clients come in and work with the students. So one of the things that I've been doing over the past few weeks is working with um, some of the companies that um, I, I'm familiar with, and, and it's, it's, it's gonna be a, broad cross-section of, of, of organizations. Um, we have one nonprofit lined up. 
Um, we have some, some companies lined up and different from different sectors, um, from healthcare, from technology, um, some larger companies, some smaller companies. And the whole idea is to put students in cross-functional teams to work with um, their client and the client, it's gonna be just like the real world. When I worked at a law firm, they're gonna give you a problem. And as the clients uh, have been sending me their problems, um, you know, sometimes I look at the problems and it's not defined quite as precisely as maybe it should be defined. And, you know, the first thing, it, you know, what I'm doing with them is kind of flushing it out just so I know that we can get to a point where it can be defined. But one of the things that I want the students to do is work with the client um, at the outset and figure out how to scope the problem because I think there's a lot of different directions that the student group and the client can take it. And it's not necessarily for me to decide, but one of the skills that you need to learn when you work with an organization is how to scope a problem. Um, so it becomes manageable. And then, you know, sort of the next step is, um, you know, how to, again, how do you work with the client? So you've scoped your problem and you need to reach agreement with the client on what it is you're going to do. So once you've reached your scoping plan with the client is confirming what the work plan is. And we're going to lay out, you know, in detail, the type of research that you're going to do to put together um, the project because, again, you might be doing space tech, you might be doing something on bioethics, it may be AI, but looking at your, your research, putting together um, your written work product consistent with the work plan that you've developed for your client. Um, and again, it teaches you to meet client deliverables. There's going to be presentation skills because I think one of the important things you need to, to do whether you're working for a nonprofit, whether you're working in government, you're working um, in academia, you're working in industry is being comfortable on your feet and giving presentations. So each group is gonna have to present um, their project to the class um, at the end of uh, the semester. And then of course, you're gonna deliver your client deliverable to your, um, your work product to your client um, at the end of the semester. And you're going to schedule um, a feedback call with them and you're going to get their feedback um, because, again, that's really important when dealing with an organization. Um, you always want to know what, what your boss thinks if you're working you know, in government. Um, you're going to want to know what your client thinks when I'm working at a law firm. We always want to know what our clients thought about our work. Um, and, you know, factor in that feedback, write a thank you note to your clients. So, you know, it's, it, it really aims to do two things, um, teaching the students the skills of how to actually go about taking a large problem, breaking it down into something that's manageable and tackling it and teaching the skills of actually engaging with the client to solve the problem, but then also in parallel, giving the opportunity to really develop the substance because you're gonna to need to build the substance in order to produce the work product. And before we throw students into the practicum, we're gonna have four um, seminars where we kind of build up to this, where we're gonna have um, classes to kind of lay some of the foundation on ethical tech. And we'll run through as a class um, some samples. So we'll, we'll do some projects in, in real time in the class. And we're gonna have a guest speaker come in in class four from one of the big companies to just run through some hypotheticals. So, so there'll be a lot of opportunity to kind of practice in the classroom before you start engaging with your clients. So that's kind of what we have in mind for the practicum this semester. That sounds really exciting. It's also, you know, consistent with a lot of um, what we've done in the MA program in general, which is uh, unlike, you know, it, it really depends on where the MA and, and bioethics or ethics is situated in a lot of schools. Um, some of them, for example, are situated in the School of Medicine and they're focused very much on clinical bioethics. Some of them are focused in uh, philosophy departments and, and those that are focused in philosophy departments really spend much more time on um, the kind of philosophical implications of uh, different questions. Um, we did something different with the MA in bioethics and science policy at Duke than any other program in the country, which is 
we intentionally paired it with science policy. Uh, and instead of it being situated, for example, in a philosophy department or in a medical school, it's situated in this unit that we created, the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, which um, sits in the graduate school, but it is a freestanding entity, like a department or a small school, um, where we decided to pair it with science policy with the idea of teaching students the pragmatic and applied skills. Um, for many people, they view bioethics as an applied ethical field. I think that's right. I think tech ethics, for example, um, the reason we include it under the bioethics uh, kind of moniker under the big name is because um, there isn't really a discipline right now that focuses just on tech ethics. Like there aren't a set of principles one draws from that are distinct from bioethics. Bioethics is a, is a field that is based on principalism. Um, but it's applied principalism and tech ethics is very much drawing from the same ethical normative foundations of bioethics. Um, and so we decided to pair it with science policy so that the students would learn those pragmatic skills. And I think the ethical tech practicum does that so well. It helps students um, be able to both be able to take what they're learning in other classes, but also what they're learning in your class and to figure out how to take a problem and to break it down and to really break it down and then to drive toward very practical and pragmatic solutions because we can talk about oughts all we want, um, but ultimately clients have real problems that need real solutions and they need real solutions that also address the competing concerns that they're being faced with, which is a lot of times I think the challenge if you're a profit driven company, how do you do right if doing right might, for example, be at odds with the bottom line. And so trying to figure that out and trying to navigate that space in the real world seems to me to be a really useful way to do so. You're teaching a second class this semester too, um, your AI seminar, which I'm, I'm hoping to be a fly on the wall for most of the semester because there's so much uh, that's rich and exciting in that content. Would you walk us through what's included within that and, and what you kind of see as the major issues that are the background? And then I want to kind of walk through some of the specific issues that you've been working on in addition to that. But can you just introduce yeah. us to that class and tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the um, second course is an um, adaptation of a course that I've taught at the University of Pennsylvania for the past couple semesters. And it really is a very current snapshot um, of AI and the law. And it, it really um, takes it very current. And you know, it, it sort of is all premised around the grand challenge of, you know, AI has so much great potential benefit for society. And the first class introduces that. Um, that concept of all the great benefits that AI has, but there are also a lot of risks um, with AI. So, you know, the grand challenge is, you know, how do we create um, the appropriate legal structures? And I use that word very broadly. Um, so society can capitalize on the benefits of AI and mitigate the potential risks. And I say to students, it's an open-ended question. And there's lots of smart people all around the globe who are struggling with this. So people should participate in, in the class. And what we do is we start looking at what are the different approaches that people have taken and try to keep coming back to that central question of, you know, what is the right solution? And, you know, we start with looking at what are all the different multilateral organizations doing, starting with like OECD, the UN, um, GPAY, uh, you know, to try to create global harmonization. Then we look at the US approach. We look at what Europe is doing. Um, we look at the at China. Um, then we look at certain um, sectoral approaches that are, are being taken, like even within the US and kind of keep coming back, you know, to what is the right, you know, what is the right approach? What are the right principles that we ought to be taking? You know, how much global harmonization do we want to take? And then we do pivot a little bit and say, you know, that there's this whole issue of trustworthy AI, which is getting most of the attention in, in, in sort of in a nutshell. And it gets back to the ethical issues. Um, you know, when a human being makes a decision, um, we know how to hold a human accountable. We know how to um, assess whether a human is, um, 
trustworthy, whether a human is biased. We know how to um, ask a human to explain his or her decision. We know how to hold a human accountable. When we start transferring those functions to a machine, how do, how do we do that? And that's the big, the big question. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we spend most of the class looking at those issues, but there's a whole host of other issues that AI raises too, like with respect to intellectual property, um, when AI starts to produce IP, who owns it? Um, competition law issues, the whole issue of access to data. So also in that class, we start looking at some of those other issues um, as well. And in that class, um, students don't write research, uh, students don't work with clients, but they're gonna um, each write a, a research paper. So that, that's what that class is all about. That sounds really exciting. It also raises uh, the point, you know, you, you mentioned a number of different things like OECD, for example, and a lot of students who are coming into a program, whether it's law or the master's program, aren't aware of all of the ways in which policy is made, right? They're not aware that it's multifaceted. We're not looking at state legislatures. It's not all about, you know, Congress. It's not all about um, you know, one particular organization. It's very much a multinational effort, and there are a lot of different actors, including actors like the OECD, the, you know, UN, the um, different ethical guidelines, even organizations are issuing ethical guidelines that oftentimes become non-binding guidelines, but can become yeah. really important for different policy. And I think one of the things that's so valuable about a course like that is helping students see the different layers of policymaking and how much of it you actually need to know to then be able to advise a client. Um, and to be able to then come to a determination as to, you know, how to give advice on a particular issue. If you don't know that whole landscape, if you don't know all of the different pieces and you think you're reinventing the wheel when actually there is a whole set of ethical guidelines and, and players that you have to really engage and be engaged with. And so I think those courses can be taken, I assume, uh, both of them, right? Students can take both the ethical tech practicum as well as the AI, AI seminar and get different things out of them. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think they can't take them at the same time. Right. They but, can't take but them part, Yeah, but I'm going to bring into the practicum some of the content from the AI seminar because I don't think you can advise, to, to your point, Nita, and I, you and I are a thousand percent aligned. You can't advise a company on what to do without considering the whole alphabet soup of organizations out there that are taking viewpoints. And even if your role in the organization is not the one to keep track of, you know, all the different organizations to know that you need to talk to the person who is keeping track of that is really important um, because you don't, you, you know, like for example, OECD, has come out with principles on AI and 40 countries have signed up with them. And you don't wanna inadvertently have your company do something that runs afoul of, of the OECD AI principles that, that would not um, go over very well. No, I think that's really exciting. And, um, you know, and, and what's great is it teaches students not just how to take on a particular problem, like the problems that they'll be working on in the classes or the background of how to do so, but it's, it's much like any area where you're learning the foundational skills. You're learning how to do it in context, um, right. but then you're able to apply it, hopefully, in many new contexts that arise as well. You're also writing on some inter interesting issues and you're speaking on a number of issues, yeah. interesting issues and you have a lot of ambitions for Duke to really grow our presence in this space, which brings me to the question of you chose Duke and there were lots of places that you could have come, gone to as your next step after leaving Covington. And, um, you know, we consider it quite a coup that you decided to come back to Duke, but it's also because you believe that Duke sits in a unique position to be able to really excel in the space of ethical technology. And so I was hoping you could speak a little bit to that. Why Duke? And what is the promise and hope that you see that makes Duke a special place to both learn about ethical technology, but the kind of growth that we can expect in the space of Duke? Yeah, no, I, I really, um, I mean, 
as I say to people in the interest of full disclosure, when it comes to bias, I am biased when it comes to Duke, but I think <laughs> rightfully so. I mean, I, you know, I've been deeply involved with Duke for years, so it's an informed bias. Um, but, you know, it, it's an, an informed viewpoint because I think to solve the problems of, you know, dealing with ethical tech and dealing with some of these issues, it really takes an interdisciplinary approach. And I've done a lot of things with a lot of other universities, you know, teaching adjunct, lectured at a lot of other universities. And I think that with Duke, there is such a commitment um, to really bring together, I mean, like science and society under Nita's leadership is a perfect example of really bringing together the different schools um, to work together on an interdisciplinary basis to solve um, the problems. And, you know, I, I just don't see that commitment and that potential at many other universities and, and sort of the excitement and the enthusiasm um, to do it. I mean, my um, original home at Duke was at the engineering school because that was um, my undergraduate alma mater. And I've been on the board of visitors at the engineering school. Um, so I know those folks really well. And, you know, they've had an ethical tech program for several years that the prior dean established that I know the new dean is bringing forward. And there's a lot of enthusiasm um, to continue there. So, you know, I, I think, um, and, and with the Sanford Public Policy School, the Keenan Institute in, in Ethics, um, the law school, you know, the, the, the faculty just communicate very well. Um, and I think, you know, also when you take a step back with broader Duke, um, you know, there's this whole science and technology initiative at the broader university level, and there's just such a commitment to do it. And I just also think, I mean, Duke is just um, such a great place to go to school. Um, you know, somebody who attended there in you know, the 1980s, not to date myself, um, you know, the friendships, the network of people that you um, cultivate at Duke. I mean, it really does stay with you for a lifetime. Um, and you can't underestimate, um, you know, the value of the relationships that you, you know, that you form at, at Duke. Um, so for me, it was kind of a no brainer on, um, you know, why to go to, Duke, you know, why not Duke? And, you know, as Nita said, uh, I've got one child, um, you know, who's already at Duke, which shows, um, you know, my commitment to, to Duke. And he looked at all the schools and, chose Duke and I've got another one starting uh, next fall. So, uh, you know, we're, we're all in with Duke. <laughs> Which is a good place to be all in on, I think. Yes. Um, yes. And as you mentioned, we have a lot of partnerships across campus. I think that's yeah. one of the strengths of science and society, but also one of the strengths of Duke in this space. So, you know, we have uh, a terrific focus that's growing in Sanford School of Public Policy. We actually have a joint hire that, um, we have an offer out uh, to another faculty member who will be focusing on tech policy and ethical tech as a joint hire between science and society and the Sanford School of Public Policy. The law school has a significant focus in this space as well, both between our joint hire with Lee, but also we have the Duke Center on Law and Technology. We have um, the Duke Innovation Policy Center and a lot of faculty, including me, who are focused on ethical technology. Um, this is, the computer science department is deeply invested in this. The School of Engineering is deeply invested. And we just launched a really cool undergraduate program called the Digital Intelligence Certificate at Science and Society, which is a partnership with a whole bunch of different departments and schools across campus, all focused on bringing basic computational skills together with the context in which those technologies are developed, used, and deployed in society um, together so that all undergraduates focus on having some of that digital intelligence to graduate, all of that translates to a huge ecosystem at Duke that just isn't available at other places. I think we're really leading uh, the pack and really focusing on this space, which I'm, I'm deeply excited about. And I suspect some of the people who have joined us for this call are interested in this space as well, and in the opportunity to be able to ask questions of Lee and potentially of me as well. So I wanna open it up to questions um, from the, those of you who are attending, whether you are current students or prospective students, um, and see what are you interested in learning about next? What are some of the questions that you have both about the program, about ethical technology generally, 
Um, Lee has been speaking and engaged with clients and writing in the space for really longer than almost anyone has been. Um, she is at the cutting edge of this, at the leading edge of this, and is seeing things uh, both at a governmental and client level in industry that most people just don't have the knowledge of. And so what questions do you have? What are some of the things that you'd like to know? Go ahead and raise a hand if you're interested. And if not, I'm just going to keep asking any questions because I could talk to her all day long. All right, we'll jump in with a raised hand at any point. I'm going to ask Lee, um, as you do some horizon scanning, which is one of the things that having your background really enables you to do, to look ahead and say, these are some of the key big issues that you see, you know, whether that is, um, you know, the deployment of algorithms, the metaverse, the cryptocurrency and kind of growth and bottoming out that's happening. What are, what are some of the ones that you have your eyes on right now? What are some of the big issues that you're really focused on and think need more attention from a policy and ethics perspective? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the whole issue of the trustworthy AI and, you know, I, I think there's definitely consensus on the principles level um, about how to actually operationalize the principles. You know, what? how do you actually... Um, eliminate bias? How do you make the AI explainable? And trying to take those principles and bringing it down into practice it is going to be a big focus. And, um, you know, I, I think we're really going to be at the point where we're going to start to see some action there. You know, it, it, regulators drive a lot of this and Europe is on the cusp of regulating. Um, and I'm also hearing from my contacts in industry that 2022 could be the year to see some breakthroughs um, there. So I think that's going to be a big area. I think data ethics is an area that um, we're going to see um, a lot of development. Again, Europe tends to drive a lot of the regulation and they've, um, they're about to enact their Data Governance Act which contemplates all these new forms of data sharing, um, voluntary data sharing. Um, but even you know, in the United States, we're seeing a lot more um, emphasis on making um, data available. And I think um, you know, there, there's a lot of attention um, being paid within organizations on you know, how to make um, tools available for data sharing. This is something, I wrote a paper on this three years ago and I'm working on updating this paper and I've got two research assistants and you know, in large part because there've been so many developments over the past couple of years. And the, the field is so nascent. And what I'm trying to do again is take a very practical approach that so there's not a one size fits all answer, but like here are the basic steps and here are the basic skills that you need to think about and the questions that you need to answer um, in order to do this. So I think that those are gonna be some of, some of the basic um, basic things. And I think, you know, just, just privacy, um, is something that's gonna get a lot of it, a lot of attention um, as well. I see Carrie, you have a question. Hi, Anita. Hi, Lee. I do. I actually have two questions. Um, so one is for you, Lee, and, and one is for you, Nita. Uh, before I begin, thank you both for, for your time and everything you've shared today. It's been really interesting. Um, so, Lee, my question for you is, you know, I think um, much of technology policy in the last year or two has focused a lot uh, on, you know, privacy and data exploitation, uh, especially as consumers become more aware of sort of the, the fine print that they've agreed to either knowingly or, or unwittingly. Um, in terms of their data, their data privacy and what they share. Um, so with regard to regulation, how would you, because I think Europe has, has put a very sort of regulation uh, first approach um, that I don't know is always as applicable with the American technological spirit of uh, move fast and break things. So how do you sort of, I guess, um, in, in your work in ethical technology policy, how do you uh, sort of marry this idea of, you know, the spirit of innovation and creativity with this idea of, okay, well, innovation and creativity is great, and we don't want to hamper that, but there needs to be sort of a, an ethical thought process as well, and that maybe a little bit of a slowing down and saying, okay, well, this is a great technology, but how could it also be used you know, for in an unethical fashion. So how do you, I guess, regulate without dampening that spirit of, of innovation, of drive and creativity that's sort of uniquely, in my view, American in the technology sphere? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think regulation itself is necessarily bad. It's a question of what the regulations say. Um, I mean, sometimes you find with company, I mean, you, you know, right now with the United States, um, I, I mean, it's kind of the why, I mean, Europe is out in front as they've been for a while with their regulations. I mean, they were out in front with privacy regulations with GDPR and they're looking to be out in front with AI regulations. And it's a very prescriptive approach to regulations. You know, what's happening in the US right now, which frankly makes it very difficult and complicated. And we get into this a bit in, in both classes, the practicum class, as well as in the seminar class, is, you know, at the federal level, um, Congress has not legislated either on AI or on privacy. And, you know, consequently, you know, so you might say, well, that means industry is free and they can do whatever they want, but it's not really the case because what, what's happening is you've that now got this very complicated patchwork of state regulations um, that keep popping up. And in a lot of ways, it, it makes it harder for industry to move forward and particularly small and medium-sized businesses because um, you know what Illinois does is different than what Virginia does, which is different than California. So the cost of compliance goes way up, and it changes. You know the, the regulatory landscape could could change. So you know, in a lot of ways, if Congress could just come up with sensible legislation on privacy on some of these issues it could make it easier for innovation. So I don't necessarily view innovation and regulation as being at odds with each other. And I think really that the challenge for policymakers is to think about, you know, what is a sensible approach for regulation? And it kind of comes to the way I sort of frame the, the seminar class is, you know, we have this great, technology, right? We, we have these benefits that we want to be able to capitalize on for society, but we also have these risks. And what are what, what's the right framework that we need to come up with so we can capitalize on the benefits and mitigate the risks and looking at what laws make sense. And sometimes it's hard law like regulations, sometimes it's a combination of soft law like standards, um, sometimes like you just need a policy document from the FTC that may not even be technically regulation, but if the FTC says something, people are going to pay attention to it and, you know, just, just trying to sort of strike the right balance. So I think it's, it's sort of looking at it through that lens that, you know, regulation, government action isn't necessarily bad, but it's doing it in a way that sort of strikes that right balance. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it absolutely does. Thank you, Lee. Um, and if, you know, obviously, if, if other people have questions, please feel free to, to go to those. But just as a, a follow up to that, um, I talked a little bit in my application for the master's program about, you know, whether or not Congress, not, not to denigrate our, uh, our state's people, but whether or not Congress has enough expertise to really be regulating things that are as technologically nuanced as AI, as self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. Because I'm thinking of, you know, most recently, I think it was uh, Representative Blumenthal who was asking Facebook whether or not they would commit to ending Finsta, which is a completely nonsensical question that made no sense in the context of what he was trying to do. Um, so I, I wonder if there, in your view, are there enough sort of people within Congress or enough um, people in the field in general to provide the kind of uh, nuanced understanding of both innovation and regulation that's sort of needed to move forward in this space? I mean, I think it's such a fast moving area that people can always learn more. I mean, I think that, um, you know, when you, when you talk about people on the Hill, I mean, there definitely are people who are very savvy and there are people who are committed to learning more. You've got the Wilson Center, which is a nonprofit organization, and they really work closely with Congress on educating them on the issues. I've participated in some closed door briefings um, that the Wilson Center has done um, for, you know, for, for, you know, for Congress. 
Um, so, you know, there definitely are avenues um, to try to educate um, members as well as their staff. Um, but, you know, I think the reality is, and, and, and of course, organizations of all types, um, the civil society groups, the companies, the nonprofits are always meeting with people on the Hill, meeting with people in the administration, educating them. But I think one of the things that benefits um, the whole community is just more and more dialogue um, because the, the, the everything is advancing so quickly. And, you know, one of the things I'm hoping through Duke is, uh, you know, I've always participated in a lot of these multi-stakeholder um, or uh, multi-stakeholder groups um, in, in conferences and bringing people together to have some of these um, dialogues and share information. And I think the more information that you can share, um, the better the conversation and it can lead to more informed um, decision making. Thank you very much. Why don't you ask your question of me and then I see Ebani, if, yeah. if I hopefully pronounced your name correctly, uh, we'll go to next. Yeah, and um, you know, I'm also happy. I feel like I've monopolized the questions a little bit, so I'm happy to let uh, Ivani go in the time that we have left. I was curious, um, my particular, uh, I guess, interest in technology policy really lies uh, at the intersection of technology policy uh, and racial equity. So I was curious about opportunities within the master's program uh, to explore that intersection further, but I'm also happy to follow up on that question in a further email or a separate conversation with you specifically if uh, we wanna capitalize on Lee's time with us. Um, so first of all, it's a great question and one that I'd say Duke as a whole is deeply committed to, um, which is increasing opportunities for scholarship and focus uh, on, on issues of racial equity. And of course, it's an issue that's deeply important within bioethics and within tech ethics and policy. Um, I'm delighted that next year we have uh, a new postdoctoral fellow whose scholarship focuses in this area, who's really emerging as one of the leading voices already in this space. Um, who will be joining us for the next two years. We'll be teaching classes in the space and who's also interested in helping to guide students. She's been teaching for the past year for our JD MA students and she'll be teaching more broadly for our um, MA students and not just for our JD MA students starting next year. And she also is mentoring some of the students who are particularly interested in that space. And so that'll be an exciting new hire who will be uh, on campus next year, who's on campus visiting this year. Um, and then uh, we have a number of affiliated faculty who are in other departments whose scholarship focuses on that space as well. And so there are a lot of opportunities to do so, both in terms of your coursework, but also in terms of your practicums and other spaces. Um, and those are areas, of course, that will come up in the ethical tech practicum that Lee is um, going to be guiding and will be teaching next year as well. And so a lot of opportunities and a good question of an area of focus, but also a growing area of strength at Duke. Um, so I'm just building on uh, from Carrie's question that she asked um, Lee earlier. Um, I, was, I wanted to focus particularly on the limitations of scientific advice. How do scientists or policymakers recognize and convey the, the limitations of scientific advice? Because I'd, I'd say perhaps like earlier on my undergraduate career, um, my scientific career, I'd, I, I took whatever scientific um, research there was as sort of concrete evidence, but as I further grew into, um, you know, further courses and learned that it's not as certain as you once thought science could be, how is that really conveyed in the um, sort of government sphere? Yeah, I think, um, you, you mean, like in terms of, um, I mean, sort of uh, it just like with, ex I'm just the sort of an example, like with, I mean, like, for example, like with data, um, I mean, I think it's just, you know, there's like a lot of discussion with respect to AI on explainability and, um, you know, just sort of clear disclosure and, you know, how reliable is something. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, you um, you know, sort of work being done that if something is not, you know, 100% reliable, or, you know, if there's concerns on, you know, that something should not be used for certain purposes, or um, touching on, you know, the prior question, if there may be bias um, in some of the scientific um, 
data because, you know, for example, if it's a medical data and the, the subjects of the um, the data study um, re reflected one population and, and may not have been fully representative of other populations, you know, there, there's certainly, um, there's been a lot of emphasis on just making sure that there's a lot of disclosure around that. So people who are receiving the information can factor that into the decision-making. And certainly, um, you know, I, there's at least around kind of the AI and some of the things that I've been working on, you know, that there's a lot of talk about it, this human centric approach and we're not necessarily viewing um, the science um, or the technology as a replacement for um, a human, but it's putting the information out there about what it can do, what the science, what the technology represents, so people can make informed decisions about how they can use it to supplement what they're otherwise doing and modify the use case um, appropriately. So, you know, I think bottom line here is a lot of um, emphasis is being placed on disclosure and on explainability and transparency. All right, other questions? Erin. Hi, um, thank you, Lee and Nita. So appreciate it. Um, so I was curious about, um, you mentioned that, that uh, interprofessional collaboration would be a huge part of the program. And I'm wondering if there are opportunities, you mentioned uh, space medicine and AI, if there would be opportunities to conduct research and um, participate with other groups within the university um, concerning that field and, and what types of uh, in particular in, in space is that we is that what you mean Aaron in, in particular in space uh, yeah in the fields of space medicine and AI yeah so um, so first one of the cool things about science and society is that it is an interdisciplinary hub across campus. And what that means is um, the way that the university set these up is you have schools. So think of schools as like school, 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 school. You have departments within those schools. And then they created, um, and I was the, the founding director as, as Madeline said, a few institutes and initiatives that span across the schools. And the idea is that you have affiliated faculty from each of the different schools who are participating in those interdisciplinary initiatives. So it doesn't sit in just one place or another, it sits across all of those places. The result is that we have a ton of affiliated faculty who are deeply engaged um, from each of the different schools and departments across campus. And we work collaboratively often across them. And so space, medicine, AI, you know, there are people who are working at the intersection, but there are also different people who have expertise in each of those domains um, who are affiliated faculty of science and society. And so to the extent that there, for example, isn't a specific class on something that you're interested in, but you want to put together an independent study that focuses on it, there's a lot of flexibility to do that within the program. And what we find is because ethical technology is such a cutting edge area, students come in with unique interest and unique interests that they want to explore. So for example, if you wanted to focus your master's research project instead of doing a practicum um, as your culminating experience, and you wanted to do it in that space, we would help you put together a faculty panel of individuals who would advise you on that, who would have the different relevant areas of expertise so that you could dive in more deeply. And then of course, there are classes at the intersection and kind of foundational classes that you need. You also get a lot of advising um, from the MA program to help you connect with those different faculty members who are engaged in those different spaces. Does that answer your question, Erin? Thank you, yes, that's completely fascinating. Um, I had one follow-up question, if that's okay. okay. Uh, in the application process, is there anything that we should be um, should we be more specific to our interests or kind of capture a broader spectrum of- we're, we're definitely interested in knowing if you have a particular area of interest. Part of what we're looking at and putting together a class is to have a diversity of perspectives of people who are coming in interested in different areas. And so if there's something you're really passionate on exploring, 
use the essay spaces to tell us about that. Tell us about your unique areas of interest, but also your unique backgrounds that you'll be bringing to the questions and to the problems. We're very much interested in an intellectually diverse class with diverse interests. So tell us, tell us your passions. Let us know that in the application process. Great, thank you so much. Sure. All right, I hope I get this right. Is it Reham? Is that how you pronounce it? Um, it's still a Reham. Reham, okay, Reham. Thanks for asking a question. What, what, can, we, what can we answer for you? Um, yeah, so I'm just, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Tiedrich about, um, you know, the, I noticed like a, it, it might seem like a big jump from um, electrical engineering to JD. And I wanted to ask if, um, you know, if you were presented with um, this program or if you like saw it, if it would um, let you ease into it or to being a JD or just like what that jump was like um, or if there was any jump. Um, we definitely have some students who have applied from the MA program to the JD program and have been accepted into the program. We also have some students who have applied to the JD program and have not been accepted into the program. Um, and so I would say it gives you an opportunity to get to know people in the law school and hopefully to build up your recommendations. It also helps you figure out if that's what you really want to do, because there's opportunity to take classes that are cross-listed between the law school and the MA program. Um, but ultimately, it's an independent admissions process to get into the JD program, and that independent admissions process right now still requires an LSAT score. Um, and uh, one of the ways in which some of our students, I think, have benefited from being in the MA program that has led to admission is not only having get it, gotten to know faculty members, like I'm a you know tenured faculty member in the law school, if I've worked closely with somebody and can speak to their competence in legal uh, analytical skills and can write a recommendation letter for them, that may help them, but they still need the scores to be able to get in, the, the foundational scores. Many students may not have as strong as an undergraduate GPA as they do their graduate GPA because they sort of learn a lot of study skills they may not have had when they were an undergraduate student, and that can make a big difference. And so having a stellar, um, a stellar set of grades from your master's program uh, and then your LSAT scores and stronger recommendation letters can definitely give you an edge in getting into law school as well. So some students make that transition. Some of them only discover once they get in to the MA program and have been in it for a couple of years that really what they want is also a law degree. And I personally think that's a great combination. You know, I have that combination of backgrounds, but you also don't need a law degree to be able to be engaged in ethical tech policy. So it is in itself a terminal degree and many of our students go on to have terrific opportunities based on being in the master's program and graduating with the master's loan. Mm, I see. And um, I wanted to ask about the, uh, I saw that there was a neuroscience concentration and that if we would, um, I guess, learn about tech policy and whatnot, um, could there be like a standpoint from that concentration? I guess like looking how well, that's what I do, right? So I focus on neurotech and you definitely can focus on neurotechnology. Um, there is neuroethics and neurotechnology, which is a, a particular area of focus. And, you know, while I do AI and other areas in genomics, my biggest area of concentration and engagement is in neurotech and neuroethics. And so most of the government commissions that I sit on, most of the um, company advising that I do focuses on neuroethics. Uh, and that's really the intersection of neurotechnology, ethics, policy, and law. And so absolutely, you can pick a technical area of focus. It's very valuable to also be exposed to other areas because, for example, I have a deep knowledge of artificial intelligence, which powers most neurotechnology. And being able to understand the issues in AI together with the issues in neurotech is really critical to be effectively advising people in that area. But subspecializations, are not only welcome, they're common in the field. Mm, so I could like, I could, I guess I could, um, I don't know if I'm, I don't want to take too much time. Um, I, I guess like um, I can go from, I guess, looking for my community or whatnot. I see there's like, there's like a lot of, um, you know, maybe group polarization or whatnot. And I guess they could, um, well, they're just discussing that, right? In our community organizations and that um, factor and, is the could, is is there a way like in this program like I could actually um I guess write a thesis on that or like um, yes explore you can, more what, so one option you have for your master's project is you either do a practicum or you can do a research paper and so your research paper can be focused in any area that you're particularly interested in. 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So let me turn to Tanya, who also has a question um, because we are at the top of our hour. So Tanya. Hi, thank you so much, Lee and Nita and everyone else that's been asking super insightful questions. Uh, I have a question that's more directed towards Lee and I hope it's okay to ask this. So I'm very excited to hear that there is a practicum, uh, practicum coming up with you know the opportunity to consult with organizations. And I know that you mentioned you are working with a few nonprofits. So is there any way you can give us a preview of some of the questions specifically in the nonprofit sector that deal with you know questions of tech ethics? Um, so for instance, I know racial equity, like you said, is an important area of focus, but I feel like that's not as amorphous because we have an idea of how you know algorithms and technology and media being presented in different areas kind of has an impact on the way people consume information, how that influences them. Are there other uh, problems that you could maybe give us an insight into that companies are looking into solving specifically in this field? Yeah, I mean, again, we're just working on the problems for um, this semester so next semester there'll be different problems and i think it's just going to be one nonprofit for this semester but it can change semester to semester and i think the nonprofit for this semester is going to have um in, in a topic focused on um space tech and we're still we want to be very careful i haven't gotten all the permissions yet to disclose um the names of the companies or the organizations and their problems at this point, so I don't want to um, jump out ahead of myself. But I think, you know, one of the um, problems will focus on space tech. I think um, another one is going to be focusing um, more broadly on the use of um, AI in the judicial system and dealing with individual rights. Um, one's going to be looking at the use of um, bias in data. Um, another one's going to be, and then a couple um, looking at uh, issues broadly dealing with um, kind of a digital health health type issues, um, dealing with making health data available. Um, using um, AI, using those types of techniques um, in dealing with uh, treating patients, um, ethical responsibilities of practitioners. I mean, that, that'll give you kind of a flavor of some of the types of issues that we're going to be going to be dealing with. But, um, you know, until we um, nail it down a little bit more and I get some more permissions, I can't, I can't go into too much more detail yet. And again, the expectation is that this is going to change um, semester, uh, you know, semester to semester. I think that's fair. And I think that also answers the question pretty broadly. It gives me a clear idea. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your thoughtful questions. We're excited that you are excited as well about um, the fact that we have uh, an amazing new member of our faculty, Lee Tydrick, who's joining us as our ethical technology uh, faculty fellow and um, also a professor of law in the law school. And a lot is happening in this space. So this is just uh, the earliest stages, I think, of the exciting developments at Duke. Um, along with the terrific courses that Lee is teaching, she also brings a wealth of new opportunities, contacts of a lot of the people she's worked with over time who are guest speakers and are interested in engaging with our students. Um, and we have an, an ecosystem of people who are in this space from David Hoffman to Buzz Waitzkin to Joel and Gellinger, a lot of people in computer science. Um, I focus in this space. A lot of people at Duke, probably one of the greatest areas of strength that are growing uh, at Duke is in this space of science, technology, ethics, and policy. So we hope that this has been instructive and informative. If you have further questions, don't hesitate to follow up with Madeline Liddicote, um, who would be happy to answer your additional questions. And we look forward to hopefully welcoming you to Duke. Take care, everyone.